Hello to all of you. Well, very excited to be another Wealthy Wednesday. And um, I'm excited to be here with my two partners, Lyndon and Lee. You know, this is always one of my favorite days of the whole month where people get to learn and, and, and ultimately get you know, access to property deals, get the knowledge. And as we're always looking for, you know, our Wealthy Wednesdays are about value, property, people, profit, purpose, and even a bit of fun. And, um, you know, we always start with, with, uh, with this slide. You, if you're new to us, you won't have seen it before. If you've been around a lot, I'm not going to read through all the details. But in simple terms, you know, we want to be a digital platform with a human heart. And so before I go any further, welcome, Lyndon. Welcome, Lee. It's wonderful to have you. And I know that we're also waiting on one of our partners from the US to be joining us. But wonderful to have you guys online. Where, where are you coming from? Hi, guys. It's great to be with you. Um, thank you, Scott. I'm coming to you from Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. It's um, overcast and windy and cold. I never thought I'd be saying that again in February. Um, it, I look forward to, to next month's Wealthy Wednesday where I can say hi from a sunny Riyadh, hopefully. Um, but it's great to be with you. We look forward to sharing with you um, today and uh, teaching you um, or sharing with you the information around some of our new partners and new deals. Yeah, and hi everyone. Hello, Scott. Hello, Lee. Great to see you guys online. Um, today, I'm coming you coming to you from my high performance office, which is actually just uh, my fancy name for my retreat that I have in the middle of nowhere that I get to go away and spend time actually getting things done and uh, spending some really strategic and creative thinking. So I am entirely surrounded today by mountains. There's not a human soul for. Uh, good many twenties of kilometers from where I'm sitting. Uh, it's hot outside though, it's 38 degrees here at my high performance office, but there is a river that flows past and a nice pool, which as soon as this webinar is done, I'm going to go and jump in. I hope the irony is that uh, with South Africa and the load shedding at the moment, because uh, on the farm you're completely off the grid, it actually uh, <laughs> it works quite well because you've obviously got everything set up and you don't have to you know, you don't need electricity. Whereas for me, I had load shedding two and a half hours ago, and you know, my whole life falls apart because I, I, you know, without, I basically need electricity and Wi-Fi and more than I need water. Right. So uh, the whole idea the behind, uh, behind these Wi-Fi. The other okay. reason I come out here is because I can choose when to turn my phone and internet off, so I can actually get some work done a lot of the time. So uh, so far, it's been a very productive day. But I always love our Wealthy Wednesday webinars. So. Uh, absolutely here and excited to be here with everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Lyndon. And again, just for if you are new, you know, and, and even for the people who've been around before, just very simply, our Wealthy Wednesdays, we want to be a digital platform with a human heart. And so we really encourage you to reach out and, and speak to, to us. You know, we, we have these Wednesdays, the first Wednesday of every month, where we are live, our team's live. You can ask us anything you want. There's not a question. Our three core values are trust, transparency, and, and uh, and alignment and we want to be able to answer questions you know we've got our wealth consultants alex fritz and the team you know they reach out speak to them you know let them know you know how, how we can help you and how we can add more value to you you know we talk a lot about wealth 5.0 and where the world is going we're evolving a lot as the world is going you know into this new decade and simply when it comes to wealthy wednesday our purpose is to give you access to good quality partners with good quality deals that's it well, 5.0, we can go into a lot of details. It's pretty much using technology. We, we ultimately want to empower people and give them the ability to invest like the top 1%, you know, in global real estate, but using technology and what we call smart investing. Something we're super excited about, and if you are interested, you can reach out to Lee, is our starter pack. We've tended to find that it can be very overwhelming for people. They don't know where to get going. There's a huge amount of information, huge amount of knowledge, which is why we created our 2020 starter pack. And with that, you get a hundred dollar voucher, you get access to our inner circle, which is our, our global community of like-minded people that are learning, growing and investing together. You get access to our e-wealth pack and all our knowledge, our micro degrees, and, um, and, and even some of our more um, advanced uh, courses in terms of where we're going. So if you're interested in that, then you know, my suggestion is just type in their starter pack and one of the wealth consultants and team can reach out to you. In terms of this evening, <laughs> Every time we do a, a, a Wealthy Wednesday on the lunchtime session, we always run through the partners and the deals. And in the evening, we have a learning session. My mother is actually in town. She's come to visit me tonight. So I won't be on the session live, but Lee will be running the session with one of our partners from the UK, a gentleman by the name of Alex Impey. We've, I've known him for quite a long time already. I met him through Roger Hamilton. 
and he's a developer in the UK, and he's going to be taking people through the five things you need to know about due diligence. Now, when it comes to due diligence, it's pretty much a standard process across the world, um, but obviously he'll be focusing on his experience within the UK as well. So highly recommend that webinar. Lee, tell me if I've got anything wrong, but um, this for me is a great webinar for people to learn from someone that's actually doing it and also in a market like the UK where there's obviously a huge amount of interest at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alex is going to be sharing with uh, Lyndon and I later on the webinar and uh, with you guys. So we do encourage you to come um, and be part of that and ask all your questions on uh, due diligence, either within the Wealth Migrate um, ecosystem or within the UK specifically. So we look forward to seeing you online later. Yeah, maybe I can jump in and add there. So, and I don't why I think this is why I think this is really exciting right now. And Scott, you and I are going to talk about it in about five minutes' time when we start talking about new partners that are going to be joining us in the next two weeks on the platform. Is that we are very excited about the possibilities in Europe and the UK for this year, and it's a, it's an area we are focusing on bringing a lot more deals from those areas. And as we're doing that, getting Alex on is a, a core part of that strategy. Uh, enabling investors to have a better understanding of that UK due diligence process so that as we do bring more UK deals through this year, uh, the, the investors, our clients, have a much better understanding about what due diligence has gone into it and how they themselves can also do a bit more due diligence if they're required. So I highly recommend it for all our investors. We are expanding into Europe and the UK this year, so tonight's going to be a great one to help you get ready for that. Excellent. And yeah, Lyndon, you took the words out of my mouth because we are, we've actually just got off a call with one of our UK partners, a guy that I've known for, for nearly 10 years now. And he says, since Brexit has been finalized, England is booming. They've had their best month in January ever. And this guy has been running a company longer than I've been running IPS, International Property Solutions, which this year is 16 years. So, you know, it's, it's basically him and I have nearly two decades. I bought my first property in London in 2002. And he basically says that this is the best January ever uh, in the history of his company, which just really emphasizes what Lyndon is saying in terms of opportunity within the UK and Europe. And on top of that, we've also got quite a lot of feedback from our clients that they're starting to feel like they're too heavily exposed uh, in America and to the US dollar, uh, which is you know a whole separate conversation um, around diversification, but, but one of the reasons we really want to bring people uh, diversity. In terms of um, the purpose of today's uh, session, it's actually about deals. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be running through some of the deals, some of the pipeline. Lyndon's going to be you know, taking us through you know, where we're going and, and, and some of the deals and, and introducing some of the partners. I know Lee's trying to get hold of one of our partners uh, at the moment. I don't know, Lee, if you've managed to uh, find him yet. No, he still, still seems to be missing in action, but we are going to track him down and hopefully have him on the webinar in a couple of minutes' time. Great. Okay, well, I'll show some pictures so that people can uh, can understand. You know, having been investing around the world since, or you know, myself since 1999 and helping people since 2004, I wanted to get into America. It's a well-known fact that when there's blood on the streets, there's good opportunity. I went to America in 2010. And quite frankly, I couldn't find any partners that I could trust. I always joked, it felt like the Americans would sell their sister to, to get a deal done in 2010. So I went home with my tail between my legs. I went back in 2012 with a different strategy and it was less about trying to find properties and actually about trying to find partners that I could trust. And from there, we started doing buyers trips. And from 2012, uh, at least four times a year, we went to America on a buyers trip where we went with uh, you know, people from all over the world to go and see the properties, to meet the partners. And what I wanted to share with you is that over the years, we built up quite an um, interesting uh, group of people because this was the second bias trip that I took people on. And you can actually see Michiel Lucas is there who left um, Siemens. He was a corporate employee, uh, wasn't really involved uh, much in property, uh, joined us at IPS and came on a very first bias trip and sort of grew his way through IPS and, and then... Um, I, I employed him at Wealth Migrate and, and you know, has gone on to be the lead uh, buyer for Orvest, basically. And the other person is Brendan Brown over there. And uh, equally, Brendan uh, joined IPS and then Wealth Migrate and has now gone on to, to, uh, to build Infinity. So what I was trying to show you is that these buyers trips have been a fairly uh, useful way for us to find uh, good quality or to train good quality property partners. Because actually, interestingly enough, 
in 2013, so it would have been February 2013, uh, we went on a buyer's trip, and uh, you can see there's a young man here, he's 21 years old, he had literally just finished his university degree, he had studied uh, property and investment at university at UCT in Cape Town, South Africa, and he persuaded his father that it was time, his father's a successful businessman, to, co to come on a buyer's trip and to invest in America. So here is his dad, uh, Peter, and this, this young man was uh, Ricky Jack, and um, he actually was one of those people that was super tenacious. He said, listen, I, I want to join your company and I'm happy to join even if you don't pay me. He came on a buyer's trip when he was 21 years old and they actually bought a house, him and his dad. And um, so I always, you know, he, he grew his way through the company. And uh, was, what was really interesting is that when you look at this buyer's trip, this was him looking at flats in, in Orlando. Uh, this was us opening bank accounts in Wells Fargo. This was us having fun in Memphis. So um, if you know anything about me, you can't work hard and not have fun at the same time. And um, from, from my perspective, why, why this is important is that at the age of 21, he was already on the ground looking at, at property opportunities around America in multiple cities. He learned how to find the right partners to get all the right people involved. And um, what was interesting is he bought his own house and then he helped a lot of people invest in houses and then, and then, and then commercial. Um, but what was really interesting at the age of 21, 22, he was talking to people that wanted to invest overseas when he had already done it himself because um, he invested his own capital. It wasn't his daddy's money. His daddy helped him, but, but, they bought their, but they bought, he bought his first property himself. And what was really interesting is that, you know, age is one of those things where you sometimes you can't think because someone's young, they, they, they don't know what they're doing. Because in his mid-20s, uh, Ricky was one of the stalwart, most important people, um, firstly at IPS and then at Wealth Migrate. What most people don't know is that all best are completely integrated with Seychelles Exchange and everything else. Uh, Ricky set that entire thing up himself. Um, so if anyone ever wants to know where the credit belongs, it belongs to Ricky. And what, what happened was that uh, I know this person very well because at about 25, he decided that he'd be the world's worst employee. And so he actually decided to go on his own. And uh, he helped uh, Brendan for quite a long time uh, sourcing property deals at Infinity. And in the last year or so, he's now gone completely on his own and, and, is, um, and is not only finding his own deals, but working specifically with partners on the ground. And with the, with the mindset of an exponential company, I know that Lyndon, I wanna hand over to you now because you've been heading up uh, from our side, you know, our supply, how we work with our partners, how we do our due diligence. And I always joke with people, we don't invest in property, we invest in partners. But having someone that we know, like, and trust that is based in, in America, that can go out and source quality partners for us is critically important. And I'd love you just to talk through the relationship of, of how you and Ricky have evolved over the last couple of months. Obviously, I've given the context back, which ironically is now uh, an eight-year journey that, that I've, I've personally been on with Ricky and many of our investors have been on with Ricky. But, um, but what I'm really excited about now is that he's actually bringing quality partners and, and thus quality deals to the table. And, and with that, I, I want to hand over to you. I do want to say welcome to everyone and goodbye. Um, I need to go to another meeting, uh, which I've got to be at at Hoppus One, and I've still got to drive there. So, so I'm going to apologize and love and leave you, uh, Lee and Lyndon. Um, I just wanted to give a bit of an intro to, to Ricky, because obviously I've had a personal relationship with him for the longest. Linda, we can't hear you. Thanks, Scott. Uh, yeah, Ricky was meant to join us 15 minutes ago and bring on uh, Rod with him, our new sponsors to the Wealth Market platform, who we're very exciting to be uh, excited to be introducing this month. Um, we reached out to Ricky about six months ago. Uh, specifically to actually work with Wealth Migrate on the ground to be uh, sourcing and finding new sponsors. Uh, we are expanding rapidly, our demand from investors is growing quickly and as a, as a result we really want to be broadening the amount of deals and the type of deals we're getting. So when I spoke to Ricky he was very excited, um, Ricky's very excitable uh, if you ever get to meet the guy, um, he's very passionate about investor education so he is starting his own blog specifically around real estate investing um, and then I explained to him what we were looking for and he said, sorry, you know, Lyndon, I actually am not going to be able to do that for you um, because he's already joined a real estate investment firm. Uh, we were very excited for him to hear that. And um, in talking further, we did more and 
our due diligence on the real estate investment firm that Ricky is now partnering with. And we're very glad to announce that after a fairly extensive due diligence process, we will probably as early as Friday, but maybe even on Monday, uh, be listing a new deal on the platform from a brand new sponsor. Uh, the sponsor's name is REM Capital. And they had said to us that they were going to be here today. It is 6.30 their time in the morning. So we're hoping that they have just slept through their alarm and that it's not something more serious, such as a sea cable being broken or anything like that. Uh, but we are expecting them to join anytime soon. What I want to do, though, is while we're waiting for them, is just give you a bit of an introduction to REM Capital. And uh, let me see if I can... Scott has left us, but he has left his screen running. So I actually want to see if I can... Um, I can grab the screen from Scott. Uh, uh, Lee, can you see if you can? Oh, there we go. All right. So, uh, Lee, can you just confirm for me whether you can see my screen? Yep, I can now. We've got good news. I've just spoken right. to Ricky, they got the time zones mixed up. Sorry, Lee. Um, I've just spoken to Ricky, they got the time zones mixed up. I actually woke them up. You could hear I woke them up. Um, but I've, I've told him that we've done the introduction and it's time for him to turn up. So I need to leave, but he will be joining you guys. Okay. All Thanks, right, Scott. great. Well, let me, let me introduce you to REM Capital in the meantime. So REM Capital are specialists in multifamily. Um, what's really interesting is that the, the driving force, so often when we look for great uh, sponsors on the ground, we often look for that particular driving force that's been in the industry for 20 years that's running or leading that company because we have found that most of the successful sponsors have had at some point in their origin story a very passionate niche expert who has built the company around their own knowledge and passion. Um, and in this case, they met that requirement. Um, at the head of REM Capital is this guy, uh, Rod. Now, Rod has two passions. Firstly, multifamily real estate investing, but his second passion is really about investor education. And if you search for him on uh, YouTube, uh, you can actually find his real estate investment uh, as, um, YouTube channel, and you'll see here that they've got, uh, I think there's something to the effect of 400 educational uh, videos that he's made over time with really, really interesting uh, titles and guests. So, for example, emotional intelligence in real estate. Now, what's fascinating for us is as we started doing the due diligence and went through a whole bunch of these, it became very clear that they understand the investor profile. They understand how investors make decisions and they are really trying to help out in educating investors to be uh, sophisticated investors. And core to that is obviously understanding when you're making a numbers-based decision versus an emotional decision just because you like the look of something. Um, so that's just one example of one of their over 600 uh, videos. Now. You can see here what's really exciting for me, and as soon as Rod and Ricky join us, I'm actually going to put him on the spot and ask him to give us a summary, is that they do yearly reviews. So here he did a review, um, and I'll have to find it in this list. And should I be investing in real estate in 2019? It had over 50,000 views. And I see recently he's just released his latest, should I buy real estate in 2020? And I'm looking forward to having them both online uh, so that he can actually give us that answers. Uh, the good news about REM Capital is that they have a deal right now that we are participating in at Wealth Migrate, uh, open to all the investors who will be on this call. We will let you know as soon as that deal is listed, and as soon as Ricky and Rod join us, um, I will get them to talk us through the deal as well as give us a bit more of their own history. However, the other good news, which I alluded to earlier, is that we have a second company, a brand new sponsor, whose deal we will be listing next week. Um, and that is called Gladfish Properties. Now, these are people we have known for a very long time. They have long relationships with some of our board members as well as uh, our CEO, Scott. Um, they do uh, real estate facilitation to investors across the UK. They have a focus on London, but in many other places as well in the UK. Um, but what's really interesting for us is once again, this is an expert. Remember, we're always looking for that one a uh, key person in their founding team that was passionate, that was successful, that had a huge amount of knowledge. And in this case, 
Uh, it's certainly the, the, the case. This is Brett, their CEO. Uh, Brett is someone that we at Wealth Migrate have been working with for a long time in terms of every time we need uh, insight into what's happening in the UK property market. And you can see here Brett's written many books. I think he's currently on about 26 books. Um, uh, you know, great titles such as the 10 minute due diligence checklist. Uh, once again, property emotional intelligence, uh, a mirror. So for all of you who thought um, that your emotional intelligence was not relevant in real estate investing, two completely different sources both confirm that it's a fundamental piece that you really need to upskill yourself in, in terms of your emotional intelligence. So this is Brett and Gladfish. We will be bringing deals from them uh, within the next week and probably uh, Lee I think we're going to work with you very quickly to get you and Brett and myself on a call so that Brett himself can take us through his deals. So those are the two new sponsors both coming through in the next two weeks. Um, as soon as Ricky and Rod join us we will talk through the actual deal that Rod and his team are bringing us. Um, what I want to do very quickly is just go onto the Wealth Migrate platform. So for many of you who are new investors, if you go onto wealthmigrate.com, you can, if you're already a member, you can sign in. Otherwise, you can click here to become an investor. You will then get through to our marketplace. And here you will see the current deal, the deals that are available. Uh, these are three deals that we've had uh, for the last six weeks. They are both, all three of these will be closing in the next week or two. And as I said, we've got a new range of deals that will be loaded. Uh, so we have had quite a few requests, Lee, as to why over this period, the December, January period, has there been slow deal movements? The answer is that our sponsors really enjoy the December and January periods, and there is very little new real estate activity that happens during December and January. This is a pattern we see every year, uh, and so it is really at the beginning of February that they all start reaching out and bringing new deals to the platform. So you can expect a flurry of new deals over the next four weeks. Uh, we're hoping to have four to five new deals at least one a week for the next four to five weeks as our sponsors are coming back to us with new deals. So these three deals here, we are hoping to close within the next uh, week or two. So if there are any investors who have not yet had a chance to get into these deals, you literally have two to three weeks to do that. Um, if we have time at the end of today, I can run through these deals very quickly. And Lee, maybe I can ask you to help me here. Um, if there are any of our investors that would like a quick refresher on these three deals, uh, please can you just drop that into the question box and I will run through the highlights of these three deals and their sponsors uh, at the end of our session today. For those of you who are new, what's very important for you to understand is this button here is probably your most important button on the Wealth Migrate platform. This determines whether you are verified or not. So Wealth Migrate is a global financial marketplace. As such, we need to ensure that we are compliant and that we know who our investors are. So for any investor who is new to Wealth Migrate, you will need to make sure that we can verify your identity. You will need to upload some documents, a copy of your passport, proof of, proof of residence, uh, the normal um, know your client journey. Uh, our platform has a very quick turnaround. It normally takes us between 24 hours to 48 hours to validate a new investor, and then we can launch straight into supporting you to get invested and broadening your portfolio. Uh, with that, Lee, I want to pause there for a second and just check has there been anything that's come through on our questions? Um, our question is about um, the wallet system, how far we are and when it's going to be up and running. Um, that is the only question that has come through so far. Great. And as that question comes through, I see Ricky's joined us. So good morning, Ricky. Uh, Scott has already publicly spent, uh, told everyone on the webinar that we had to wake you up this morning as we got the time zone slightly wrong. <laughs> Yeah, Ricky, so welcome to the webinar. It doesn't matter how shiny happy you look, we do know that you've just stumbled out of bed, but we really do appreciate you joining us all the way from the States and making yourself available to discuss um, your deal and introduce yourself to our community. So welcome. Oh, so Ricky, can't... we can't hear you. Uh, you're not muted, so can you just check maybe your, your sound system? Nope. So, 
while you try and figure that out, I'm going to answer the wallet question. But keep talking, Ricky. The minute that we hear you, we'll let you know. <laughs> All right, Ali, that was a great question about our wallet system. Um, for many of our investors, you know, this has been something that's been the priority on our development list for the last uh, four to five months. Um, we were hoping to get it done by the end of January. We are probably about two weeks behind schedule. The delay is not so much on our side. It's a compliance delay. Um, we to offer wallets in a secure environment like ours on a marketplace for global investors, the compliance journey is very, very thorough. And we do both due diligence on the partner and the banks that are holding the money at the back end, as well as them doing very thorough due diligence on us. Um, the bank in this particular case has got uh, one or two uh, documents they are still requiring from board members on our side and from board members on Lemonway side. And as soon as those go through, we should be able to implement the wallets. The technology system is ready. So it is literally just about getting that um, those final uh, compliance pieces up and running. So our, our um, expectation is that by mid-February, we should have the wallets up and running. And that will make it much easier for all of us to complete the investment process. And the really good news is it will give you a transactional account on the platform. So what that actually means is that every time you get returns from your investment, it will go onto a wallet on the platform and you can then choose what you want to do with that. Hey, Lyndon, are you hearing anything now? I can indeed. Good morning, Ricky. Right. Good Hi, morning. Ricky. What happened there? My mic was on, but I uh, just dropped off and re-logged back into the meeting. Good morning, everyone. My apologies for the misunderstanding. Good morning. Uh, no Thank worries. Scott has, okay. Scott has already shown everyone um, photographs of your and Scott's history on bias tours. And I oh, think there was, a particular, there was a particular slide he shared where you guys had gone out for a party on one of the bias trips. So I think um, for all our investors, and maybe Lee and I, we're beginning to wonder if maybe last night was one of those celebratory nights for you. One of those celebratory nights. <laughs> Believe it or not, we've got three different deals under contract at the moment. So I was on site most of yesterday. Um, the first deal that we got coming up is the one I believe we'll be speaking about a little bit today out in Cincinnati, uh, the views of Mount Airy. And so it's just been back to back to back. And I think trying to fit too much in in too little space of time is what's caused this. But very excited to be on the call today and look forward to sharing a bit more about the project with you. Brilliant. Thanks, Ricky. And let's dive straight in. So I've given a very high level overview of um, REM Capital. Uh, spoken briefly about Rod. Uh, you know, we've had a quick look at his YouTube channel and seen the extensive amount of uh, uh, material that he has there for people to be able to go and use it for educational purposes. But maybe yeah. you can just give us a quick summary of REM Capital Partners. Uh, you know, what's your role there and a little bit more about the company? Great. So the company was really founded in about 2016 when uh, Rod had started his podcast. They started getting more and more demand in the multifamily space to put, put a business together. So up until that point, they hadn't taken any outside equity. Um, they were doing deals themselves and that's where Rod met Robert and the two of them decided to get involved and work together. Rod still day to day is mainly involved in the um, Kind of coaching side of things the podcast there's a number of different programs and businesses that he runs on his side and robert who was uh, supposed to be on the call this morning is the cfo of that business as well as the ceo of rem capital so rem capital is really a very original name it just stands for real estate management and uh, robert's been in the business for over 25 years he started out in wall street he worked with the fund over there that was uh, doing about 500 million dollars and they worked it up to I think it was just short of two to three billion dollars over that time period. They did a lot of multifamily transactions and then also did a lot of uh, focus specifically on the uh, office space too. So that was kind of his niche and we, we earned his stripes, so to speak. Um, and then the team slowly started to come together over the last year. I probably met them about two years ago, um, working with another group that you guys have raised capital for in the past and uh, we we're looking to place equity with some different sponsors and that's where i happened to meet them was through the podcast i got to meet them out in sarasota and my role with their group today is as acquisition uh, i head up the acquisitions so i spend a lot of time doing due diligence underwriting deals looking at the deals and then get, trying to get them under contract so great thanks ricky yeah 
Sure. Um, three deals at once. That's very brave for uh, for a sponsor. Is that something normal, or are you guys going through a rapid expansion stage right now? So uh, last year we did just under a thousand doors, so we did about 896 units. This year we're trying to get 1,500 to 2,000 doors. Um, there's just a growing appetite for the multifamily product out here in the States. Uh, and with such a strong team, especially with Robert and all of his experience, it's really been beneficial um, for us having that credibility, having that authority in the market and being able to go out and execute in a business plan. So I'm quite fortunate to be able to work with people that are driven, uh, that are decisive and that know what they want to get and we're going after it as a team. So I would say that it's probably not normal for most groups, uh, but given given the execution team that we've got on board, I think it's exciting, it's achievable, uh, and we're on track to our 1500 homes. So we just got to do a couple extra before now and the, between now and the end of the year. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot here, Ricky. So um, multifamily has been a very popular asset class for the last year or two. Uh, we've certainly seen that at, at a lot of the global surveys. It's probably one of the highest, um, the, the highest transactional values are moving through multifamily, in particular in the US at the moment. Yeah. Uh, your sense on where's, where's the peak in the multifamily journey? And uh, I guess the second question is, is around the next two to three years, there's a lot of skepticism as to where the global economy is going and what's your perspective and your company's perspective around multifamily as a solid investment during downturns? Perfect. So our investment strategy is always to hold five to 10 years. Uh, I'm glad you asked this question. So typically you'll find over a 10 year period, you can ride out almost any cycle. Uh, it's it's the it's when you're trying to flip out of a deal in two to three years that I think it gets a little bit scary. We don't necessarily believe in market timing. Uh, while it would have been a great advantage to have bought, I don't know, if throughout 2012 up until uh, probably it's been more difficult this last few like two years. But any time between 2012 and 2015, I'd say would have been a great time to buy. I wish we had bought more at that stage. Unfortunately, we hadn't. All that happens now is my job up, steps up a little bit. So instead of reviewing $3,000 to buy 300, I've actually got a spreadsheet I could run through with anyone. Uh, I've looked at about 31,000 doors for us to get the last 300 under contract. So for us, we're not big believers in market timing. We we'll always underwrite deals to make sure that we can kind of uh, weather any storms. So we'll underwrite a 25% vacancy on a property, which is pretty, uh, pretty unlikely. So even if you go back and you look at all the data on apartments investing and you look at what actually happened uh, throughout these past recessions, you'll see in the apartment space, it was the least impacted of all the real estate sectors. So that in and of itself says something and I'll be happy to share that report with anyone interested. Ricky, you mentioned there that you underwrite the deal. So for some of our new investors, maybe people new to real estate investment and new real estate investment to multifamily in the US, what do you mean by that? Sure, so when I say underwrite deals, and my apologies for looking like an angel out here, I'm really, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> I've got this halo over my head and on the other side, we don't have, the sun hasn't quite come up yet, so the light isn't coming through the window. But We are on the no illusions, Ricky. <laughs> Gosh. but what i mean by that is uh, essentially we're out there we're looking for deals uh, or i'm specifically looking for deals and then what i'm doing is i'm taking all of the financials and we're putting it in a model we're stress testing that model we're seeing whether the deal works or not we're seeing how much upside there is so a large part of our strategy is to do what's called the value add strategy that means we'll take a property that uh, as an example is 80s built, it's renting for $800 a unit and uh, in the nearby area there might be other properties that have either been recently renovated or newly built that are renting at $1,000 or $1,400 and essentially what that allows us to do is to take the, the property that we're buying that's old at $800, do a renovation, increase the rents and create value. So we like to that that's typically what i'm looking for when i'm doing underwriting as such or due diligence on a deal and then we're also stress testing different debt models so if we were to use uh, what's called bridge debt or permanent debt what are the different options how does the deal look in that situation 
And then it's really a case of back and forth with the sellers to try to find out whether there's a reasonable price point or whether the market's just crazy. I mean, you see all kinds of deals. So sometimes I don't know who's buying it, but properties do seem to be trading. And so you just got to make sure you're not the person buying the rotten egg. Absolutely. So Ricky, you mentioned two things there. Once again, I just want to make sure we're bringing all our investors along with us from the, the early beginner investor all the way to the sophisticated one. So the first thing you spoke about was value add strategy. So as Ricky has said, uh, the value add strategy is where you have an existing building that's already running. It's generating income. It has tenants in it. You're getting money out. How, so you can buy that and you can earn that income. Uh, this particular strategy looks for buildings where not only can you start off already earning rentals, but by doing something different in the business model, you can increase the potential of how much you're going to earn. As Ricky said, he looks for areas where the area in general, the rentals have increased, but the particular property he has bought or he is looking at, those rentals have not yet increased to match the area. So then through changing, making small changes, uh, he can upgrade the facility, upgrade the multifamily development he's got, and thereby over time, either just increase rental and keep the existing tenants or increase the rental and get new tenants in at a higher level. So that's the value add strategy. You will still get returns from day one because you have people in the buildings. You are still earning money. Every three months you will get your dividends. However, there is a bigger upside at the back end because of what Ricky and the team are doing is adding value to the business model that is underlying the value of that, of that um, business. If anyone's got any questions about that, please drop them in the question box and we can happily take them. The second thing you mentioned, Ricky, was stress testing. So for those of our, our investors who are new to this, can you maybe just give a bit more example? What, what is stress testing actually and how do you do it? Sure. So when it comes to stress testing and when it comes to risk, for me personally, the most important thing is uh, can we or can't we service our debt, right? Um, because that's the ultimate risk for any investor on any property transaction, in my opinion. Uh, the rest of the things you generally have insurance for. So uh, one of the properties that we've got is REM was actually hit by a tornado towards the end of last year and uh, it was a little bit of a scary <laughs> scary situation but it's turned out exceptionally well we're going to have a brand new building brand new tenants brand new rents um, that are well above what we had pro forma and estimated so for most of those situations there's insurance or something covering you the side where there's not is uh, just poor execution and poor planning and then you've got a bond that you can't service each month so on every single deal, what we like to pay major attention to is something called your debt service coverage ratio. So that's essentially your gross income minus all your expenses. Um, can that income that's remaining service the debt comfortably and by how many times? So most lenders and banks require 1.25 times. So we always try to keep a, a like eye on that and just make sure that we're all over it. Um, so we want to make sure that we can service our debt on a, on a monthly basis and we want to make sure that we can still service our debt even if we lose 25% of the tenants. So if we're operating a tenant or if we're operating a building and it's 90% occupied, if it was to drop to 75%, what does that look like? Can we still operate the building safely with, while being able to service the debt payments and not run any risk of a default? Because that's really your biggest risk. Uh, at least from my perspective. So we always want to make sure we stress testing to see whether we can or can't service the debt and meet all of the debt covenants. So the commitments that we've made to the lender or to the bank. So that's essentially what we're doing. Great. So Ricky, if I can unpack that a bit once again, um, I think we've got a diverse range of investors and we always want to make sure that everyone's on board with um, what are actually really good real estate investment terms that everyone really needs to understand. So, yeah, sure. uh, and Ricky, maybe as a dive in there, do you as REM Capital have a base a loan to value that you tend to operate from? Well, look, what's it your, depends, what's your sweet spot? everything depends on the on the transaction. It's difficult to give you a, a one-off shot. Um, I would say that if it's a stabilized deal, we're looking for at least 1.3 times. You'll see on the views deal, I think uh, we're substantially higher than that, if I remember correctly. I've been looking at two other deals very recently, so um, sure. we'll be able to go through that if you'd like to in the 
there's definitely more cover there than 1.3 times. So, and that's purely because of the, the spread in the cap rate to the interest rates. So I don't want to get too technical, but uh, I think that'll be fun at some points in time to discuss. And yeah, we normally look for at least 1.3 times or higher, um, but it also depends on the deal itself. So there's some situations where the deal is not stabilized. So that means it's you're buying it at above a 90% occupancy, then it's stabilized. And if it's below um, 90%, then it's unstabilized. And that presents a different opportunity. So it just depends on a deal by deal basis. But typically speaking, we try to get 1.3 times the cover. So if you're servicing debt at $100,000 a year, you want to make sure your income after all expenses is $130,000 a year. Brilliant. So let's just quickly unpack that. So let's let's assume that we have a building that's worth $100. I'm going to keep it very simple. And cool. you've taken a loan out on that at 7%. So it's $70,000 you've borrowed from the bank. Now, as Ricky said, the biggest risk you have when you do deals or play in the space is that you cannot pay the bank the interest that you owe them for the $70 you borrowed. That gives the bank the right to step in and sell your building from under you. They not care. They're not going to care whether they get the actual value, the hundred dollars, as long as they can sell it and get their seventy dollars back. They are happy because they've covered that risk. So for a sponsor like Ricky and REM Capital, the biggest risk they face and we as investors face is that at some point the business model cannot, on that monthly basis, pay the interest rate that they need to pay to keep the bank who has loaned them that $70 out of the $100, the money they earn. So as Ricky said, what they do is they make sure that they, let's say, as he said, they've borrowed $70,000 and let's just keep it simple, they know they need to pay um, $1 back a month. Um, then they want to make sure that this business is making at least $1.50, $2 a month so that even if they lost a whole bunch of rentals, 25% of the people left the building and they had empty apartments. They would still be making enough to cover both their general expenses as well as that bank interest because that then protects them from ever having the building sold out from under them by the banks. Uh, Ricky, is that a pretty good, very elementary summary of, of your stress testing and the, the risk piece? That's perfect. So I'm happy with that. I think the other thing that we like to consider is other than the, the occupancy dropping 25% is more case of um, what happens if the rents go down. So we would also consider maybe the occupancy stays close to where it is, but how far down can the rents go before we run into any issues? So that's just another metric we like to take a look at. Um, and then, yeah, there's a lot of other things that we could get into, but I don't know if it's worthwhile going through all of them on this call. No, great. I think what we should do, Rick, is get straight into the actual deal, uh, Mount Airy. You know, we've had a look at it. Um, very exciting deal. Uh, what I'm going to propose is, I'm not sure if you're able to share your screen, if you're ready with a brochure or a, a document that you can talk us through, then I, if you are ready, then I'll make sure that I swap the screen through to you. Sure. So just can... before we, we start yeah. that, guys, we've got a few uh, questions that have come through from our community, and I think it's a great time to... Um, answer those now. Um, sure. So Frank has asked us, uh, do the owners of REM Capital put their own money into the deals or is it for the investors and loan from the bank to close out the deals? Great question. So um, just ask the second part of the question again. So on the front end, yes, REM Capital does put in money into each and every deal. We typically do around 10% of the deal. I just didn't catch the second half of that question. So the second half of that question was just um, question. for the investors and a loan from the bank to close out your deals. Yeah, so so it's it's capital from the investors. So typically the equity stack, um, I mean, each deal is different, but let's say it's 70% loan to value, we'll get 70% from the bank, and of the remaining 30%, we'll raise a portion of that from the investor base and then we'll put 10% of that normally in from REM Capital. Yeah, Lee, maybe I can jump in here. So that's a great question and it's one of our requirements. We will not 
accept a sponsor onto the Wealth Migrate platform if that sponsor does not put their own cash in, into deals alongside our investors. So any deal on the Wealth Migrate platform at one level or another will always require that the sponsor has a degree of their own money invested. Thanks, Lyndon. Um, another question that has come through is from Noel, and he wants to know if you fix your interest rates, and if so, for how long? Great. So, so if you're doing permanent debt in the States, almost everything's fixed. Uh, and when I say permanent debt, I mean agency or a HUD loan. So um, Fannie and Freddie uh, are the two main agency lenders that we make use of. So whenever we're doing agency debt, we're able to fix our loan and our interest rates. Uh, and that's typically locked in for the loan term, which would normally be around a 10-year term, but the loan is actually normally amortized around 30 years. So um, it would be a fixed rate for 10 years is the answer to that. Awesome. And then one more question. Um, was what were the last um, REM financial results like? Um, I assume you mean the actual projects is what they're referring to as opposed to the company's financial results. So uh, we do everything on a deal by deal basis. Uh, so far we've had a couple of deals that are doing exceptionally well, some that are doing average and some that are a little behind uh, on the pro forma. As one could imagine, you get a bit of a basket mix of everything. Um, but every uh, the deals on the whole are all going smoothly. Um, I think as I mentioned before, we've had one or two hiccups with the tornado on the one property, but uh, the whole thing's being redone. So there's certain things that you can't plan for, uh, but on the whole, everything's going smoothly. I'd be happy to share some of those, the results with you. We've got some wonderful assets running at 97% occupancy out in Dallas, uh, and they've done an exceptional job there as a group. And yeah, paying, paying on a timely basis, everything goes, everything's going fairly well, uh, touch wood. So, we're very grateful for the deals that we've done so far. We try to be as conservative as possible. And uh, like any business, there's certainly some hiccups that you can expect along the way, but we've got a committed team to resolving everything. And we've got a very experienced group of individuals based out in the States here that have been born and raised here and that really know the market well. So come Ricky, let's put REM Capital on the spotlight. On average, your returns for 2019 at a cash on cash level. Cash on cash, we're probably anywhere between eight and twelve percent, depending on the project. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, that's the cash on cash. I mean, the the internal rate of return is always a a bit of a fictitious number, which you know once you sell. Yeah. So, considering we're yeah. holding for five to ten years, we haven't moved anything yet in this market. Um, but uh, I think I could speak to a strong track record with Robert in terms of his background and uh, some of the results that he's had in the past. Yeah, and no, I understood. I'm, uh, we fully aware the IRR really becomes real at the back end, not necessarily as a speculative number up front, which is why we put you on the spot on cash on cash, so no worries there. Um, Ricky, I have, I have given you the screen. I'm not sure if you're able to share your screen and let's have a look at this particular deal that we are going to be loading in the next week. Sure. So, uh, are you seeing it right now or not? I am not. Lee, are you seeing a screen at the moment? No. No. Okay. Let's just yeah, hit that show screen button. Got it. So, sorry, I'm leaving my panel on the right here. So I'll go change presenter. Show. Should already be allocated to you, but yep. Yeah. Just allowing some permissions on my map. So quickly, while you're doing that, I notice um, that there are one or two other questions that came in earlier that were not specific to REM that we haven't dealt with. So, sure. uh, Ricky, I'm just going to answer one or two of them quickly while until such time as your screen shows. So please just keep Is it showing, showing now. Right? I'm not seeing it. Lee, are you? No, not yet. Not yet, okay, so play on the share screen button. Let me see what's going on here. Yeah. Sure, no worries. So, um, so my, there we go, now we can see it. Got it. Are you seeing the slideshow now? 
for the yeah, MPL. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So let me okay, let you let quickly me before you, uh, Ricky, I want to prioritize getting into you or take, taking us through this deal. So just Sheila, Jenny, and Farouk, uh, I do see your questions here. Uh, we will get around to them at the end. If not, then I will make sure we reach out to you individually to give you answers on your three questions. Uh, so we have seen them. Thanks. Please don't uh, get worried that we're not paying attention to them. But I think, you know, with Ricky online, let's dive into the views of Mount Airy. It sounds, I mean, it sounds like a, a great name. It sounds like a very um, idyllic place to live. Yeah, so so I would, I personally probably wouldn't live there as of today. I think once we've done with the renovation, it's going to be in a great uh, space. It's definitely in the path of progress. And um, there's a there's a lot of work to be done on this particular project, so I'll take you through some of that shortly. But I think that it's a great investment opportunity. We're buying at a really good price point, um, which is pretty rare in this market to buy such a good cash flowing deal. So I am quite excited about the whole property. I feel like it's already a lot of the risk is off the table when you're buying with such a healthy cash flow, uh, and you can get a bit of a feel for the property over here. So. I'll take you through some of it. If anyone wanted to look up the address, they've got it over there. So it's 2992 High Forest Lane, Cincinnati, Ohio. And it's a 282 unit value add C-class multifamily investment opportunity. So multifamily is typically categorized among a number of different classes. So you get A-class, which is very new construction, upper end of the market. You get B-class and then you get C-class multifamily. As an investment group, we like to focus on B and C assets. Um, and with an exception of, I think we're trying to avoid a C minus or D plus kind of asset because it just gets a little bit, uh, the, the tenant demographic, it's quite difficult to work with and it's way more difficult to turn these assets, assets around. So this is a C class asset, which we think we can reposition um, through doing a bit of renovation and given that it's in the path of progress, I think we're going to keep attracting a better and better tenant profile. Um, there's actually a new Amazon that's dropped in there close by, which a number of our tenants are working for. So I think we're slowly going to start attracting a better demographic. Quite a few of the tenants are so younger demographic. Uh, and so the tenant block is just kind of primed for having that renovation where you can achieve a slightly higher rent, but the tenant can now get a nicer lifestyle to be able to live within. So the so project- Richard, Can I just stop you there? Because I think you're mentioning a very important point here for our investors to consider when you're looking at multifamilies. Um, Ricky's mentioned the A, B, C, and D classes. Uh, a class is really top market, the high, um, high level and then obviously it drops down from there. Ricky, we had a colleague, an ex-colleague of yours on about two months ago, uh, bringing one of his deals through our platform. And uh, Brendan and Brendan was saying that in the, when a recession hits, you don't want to be holding a class. Do you have yes. any opinion or thoughts on that comment? Uh, I think Brendan's spot on with that comment. So the, the problem is when a recession hits, obviously it puts strain on the economy and the renter. And the only alternative for that renter from an A-class property is to move down towards a B and for a B to move towards a C. And the option for a C is not many other options. So um, from that perspective, I think it's really important to pick your to pick your class well. The other thing that's also, I mean, it's not just a case of renter pressure, it's also a case of what are those trade at. So the, the beautiful A-class stuff normally trades in today's market around a four to five cap. So if you consider interest rates are just sub four, um, there's a very tight spread there uh, when it comes to managing your risk and very little very little uh, room for it to move downwards. Whereas on some of these BC assets, we're buying anywhere between a five and a seven cap and that really allows for a safer window um, of error or margin of error. Gotcha. So we're not going to get into cap rates today. We don't have time. But I think the point Ricky's making is that if you're buying an A-class, the building itself is very expensive in compared to the ratio of how much money you're going to get in return for rentals on it. So because of that, you have less leeway. You've already paid a lot for that building. Whereas as you go into uh, B and C class, your ratio of what you're paying versus your rental is far more, it's better, which means that you can still remember that conversation we had earlier about managing your risk and making sure that your rentals are keeping you in a healthy cash flow situation so you're never getting into a risk with the bank. When you're not paying a high 
price at the very beginning, you're far more likely to be able to stay out of that risk. Um, thanks, Ricky. I just wanted to capture why BNC class was a good space uh, to be in at this point. Please keep going. Absolutely. So I think Robert's actually just sent me a text to say that he's joined the call. I don't know um, if your Lee can just have a look in the background there if he's come on as a panelist. I'll sure, we will do that. While you look at that. So uh, the projected return and uh, Lyndon, I'm not sure what the limitation is on Wealth Migrate side. This has obviously been prepared for a US based raise where we've got a, a 5 or 6C Reg D um, ruling. It's only for accredited investor, but I know on your side, you guys have set it up differently. So our minimum investment is typically $100,000, but through the Wealth Migrate platform, uh, I don't know if you maybe want to speak on that while I'm on this slide. Yeah, absolutely. That's the secret and the joy of Wealth Migrate Platform is we aggregate our investors um, so that we can actually bring investments that are normally only available to people who start at the 100,000 uh, through Wealth Migrate, no matter where you are in the world, except for the US, ironically. Uh, yeah. We can accept investors at much lower levels. This means we can give you, the investor, access to institutional quality deals like this one uh, without having to be a fund or a high net worth uh, investor. Um, so our minimum on this deal is likely to be five thousand US dollars. Um, so we've really we've dropped it by twenty percent. Uh, well, by you know it's our our amount is uh, two thousand percent less than Ricky's if my math does us good. So um, we've certainly made it far more accessible to a global investor base. Correct. So. On this particular project, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as a group, we like to do an investment term of five to ten years. Our projected cash on cash annually is ten to thirteen percent, and our projected IRR is sixteen to eighteen uh, percent. So the project as a whole really cash flows well, and I think that's probably one of my favorite things about it. Um, in I terms mean, those of are great, those are great numbers, Ricky, and I'm um, so very exciting. Those numbers are great. Your confidence in that number? My confidence in the number is really good uh, because our projections are not that wild. We don't need to um, totally turn the asset around in order to achieve that. We're buying at a good price point. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable um, from the basis that we're starting at and the financing that we're able to assume. Um, so we're assuming a loan in this one, which means that we're not applying for new debt. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that or just skip over that, but essentially what it means is we're we're buying the deal with the debt that it already had in place and uh, we're also buying it at a good cap rate and so the ability to hit those numbers um, are definitely not simple but I, I think that they're well within reach and I'm very confident that we'll hit those. Yeah Ricky great can I just say we do see Robert on the back end so Robert good morning uh, Thanks for um, joining us. You're welcome. If at any time you want to jump in, please also do share your camera so that the, uh, our investors can get to know you. Um, you're welcome to do that. It'll be great to have you on. And please do jump in and uh, add to anything you'd like to add to what Ricky has to say at any point. Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you loud and clear. Oh, welcome. good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Sorry about the video. I'm I think I'm going to switch over. I was on my phone and I'm just going to try to switch over to laptop. So maybe that'll work, but I'll sure, jump no in. Worries at all. Brilliant. Go for it, Ricky. Thank you. Uh, Robert, while we got you on, a, on the line, maybe it'll be good for everyone to hear it from a, an actual American. Um, what's the market <laughs> been like in, in Cincinnati, Ohio? And uh, what are your thoughts? What's got you feeling so positive about the location of this project? Well, first of all, can you understand me with my weird accent? Is everybody good with that? <laughs> uh, just kidding. Um, yeah, so Cincinnati, um, this particular project is in one of our, I guess I would say our top 10 markets that we're focused on. And part of the reason for that is because we like areas that we feel we can, we can be in the path of progress of this revitalization of the downtown areas. Um, and a lot of cities are doing that. Mostly older, older cities, you know, you don't find it quite as much with the newer ones, but Cincinnati being a pretty old city, there's a lot of revitalization opportunity. And secondly, the reason we like that is because there's very little, if any, new inventory in these markets. So in a Dallas market, for instance, or even an Atlanta market, you have a lot of new construction coming on board. Now, you do have a lot of population growth, too, but um, Cincinnati is a little bit different in the sense that you have 
very little new inventory in that infill downtown area. And so as you have an increasing uh, resident demographic, they're making more money, the jobs are better, they want a nicer place to live, there's literally no place for them to go. So what we try to do is come in to a place like this, um, renovate it, bring them what they want, and of course, we're able to charge more rent, and that's really the bottom line here in this situation. So the, it's a very, I would say, a high-yielding project, and that's really the, the, the part that we like about it. And the Midwest in general in the States is a pretty good yield market, um, and that's one of the reasons we like to focus on the Midwest. We get some good returns elsewhere, but the Midwest usually is you know, about a point or two better than the rest of the country, which is nice. So, Absolutely. Perfect. And then just in terms of the uh, location, I don't know if you're, let us know when you're on your laptop, Robert, and ready to fire, maybe take over on this presentation. But for now, we're on the major jobs nearby slide. Um, and one of the things that are so important to us as a group is making sure that there are obviously employers in and around the area. Um, and just to give everyone an idea of, of what's going on. So the property is located over here at point A. And these are some major employers is downtown Cincinnati. Uh, and just to get an idea of the markets and where the tenants are actually working. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Robert. Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of things that are important here. So number one, there's eight Fortune 500 companies that are based in Cincinnati, um, which is always a big plus. Whenever you see a Fortune 500 company based there, you've got a lot of high level jobs that are concentrated in that area. And then the other thing, which we do have a slide on is Amazon is building a one and a half billion dollar uh, distribution hub, which is gonna bring about 2000 jobs to the area. And we already have 40 people uh, currently living at the complex that work for Amazon. So that will continue to ramp as they uh, come to completion next year on this, this uh, hub. The other thing that I like to point out is that I think you see some things in this area, such as the Amazon expansion, that really uh, helps to, to prove that this is a market that people are very interested in. Businesses are really focused on investing in. And again, that's where we want to be because jobs are the main factor that drives multifamily investment. If you've got a good job base and you've got a job, good employment environment, that's, going to, that's what's going to drive our business plan of being able to raise the rents and therefore provide value to our investors. Absolutely. Thank you. So, um, I'm just running over some slides over here. We've got our area, so there's this, speaking of the Amazon headquarters that'll be opening. We've got some of the area demographics. It's important to us is understanding what is the median house value, uh, what is the median household income, and what is the median monthly rent. And uh, maybe you could elaborate on why those are important. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry for jumping around the slides. Um, trying to fit it all in. but. Yeah, the area demographics, I think the biggest thing here to, to take away is um, both median income and median house value. So whenever we buy a property, if the per unit price that we're paying is close to the median house value, it's usually not a positive thing because you really don't want to have people that are renting something that costs $100,000 for us to buy, or they could go buy a house for $100,000 because typically they're gonna go buy a house. Or you may not have that barrier to entry that you wanna see in a market where the cost of buying a house is significantly more. Mm -hmm. So in our situation, we're buying a property at 53-ish, give or take, $53,000 per door. And the median um, house value is almost three times that. So that's the kind of ratio that we like to see because it does present a barrier to entry for people to move from an apartment to a house. And again, this is also why we tend to not like to be in the A space because somebody who lives in the A space can typically flip back and forth, whether they feel like they wanna live in a house or not. Um, so we really like this, you might say workforce housing for people that generally are um, in the apartment space because they have to be, they can't afford to be in a house. So that's part of it. And then the second part is the median income. Um, we always wanna see preferably three or more times the income versus the rent. So, which you guys are probably familiar, basically the idea being, if you make $36,000 per year, you can spend $12,000 on rent or $1,000 a month. Um, that's kind of a good ratio. Now, in our case, 
at this particular property, our average resident actually makes 4.3 times the rent, so significantly higher than the sort of industry standard ratio. Now, if you get into an area where you see two and a half to three times, that's not a good ratio. So those people generally cannot pay the rent and or, you know, you're going to have some delinquency issues. So normally when we go into an area, we like to see four or five, maybe even six times the median income versus the rent because we want to go into an area where we're able to raise the rent, meaning, you know, somebody's paying less than what they could and we will go in, provide value to them, increase the the uh, amenities of the complex and, and um, you know, make it look nicer and then raise the rent and they're able to do that. So those are kind of the big things that the average rent is, um, it's important, but not as important because again, that's a little bit of a nuanced number because you've got, you know, everything from A class all the way down to D that averages into that $697 a month. Um, but again, you know, if the average rent was $200 and we were trying to go into the market at seven or eight, that would be a, a little bit of a concern. Um, but in this case, that's not the situation. And one thing I will say is that we are kind of at the edge of the path of progress for where things are at currently in this market. And we have properties that are competitive to us about five minutes away, well, not even five minutes away, that are charging uh, 50 to 70% more per month than we are. So our goal would be to raise our rent 20 to 30%, kind of meet in the middle, provide a similar level of finish inside of our units, provide a superior management, and um, are typically we're able to then, um, I don't want to say the, well, steal the resident, but that's not really true. We're not trying to steal them. But I mean, really what we're trying to do is provide a better value than our competition. Um, and so, of course, then we're able to be at 100% occupied and we're able to have the rent increases that we, we put in our pro forma, so. That was great. Thank you so much for highlighting that. Um, I'm going to, Lyndon, I'm just conscious of time um, with me having jumped on later than what you guys had planned. How much time have we got to work through these slides? Because I just want to know if I should be uh, rushing through some of the less meaty sections. Uh, Ricky, I think we're going to need to start wrapping up on this and see if there's any questions. So maybe about another three to four, five minutes for my suggestion is go straight to the kind of the highlights that you want to emphasize. Uh, yeah. As we list the deal on the platform, we will make the um, documents available. And also, if any of the investors have questions, we'll gather them and pass them on to you to be dealt with offline. So, my real suggestion is maybe get to the bit you really want to emphasize, um, and then we can talk to the investors about the path forward to if they want to be part of the deal. Perfect. So, just out of interest, sake, have there been any questions coming through from the investors on what they would like to see? If I can address that first, or otherwise, I'll just um, make a call on where to start in terms of the most important sections. Yeah, so Ricky, at the moment, we don't have any more questions uh, coming through from our attendees at the moment. Okay, great. So, so the property itself, as we mentioned before, it's 282 units. It was built in 1973. Uh, there's 18 buildings, and I think I'm not sure if all of them, but most of them are three-story buildings. Um, and in terms of the amenities, we've currently got a clubhouse, we've got an outdoor barbecue station, nature trails, there's a 24-hour business center, playground, and laundry facilities. For those of you not familiar with the multifamily space, um, a lot of the bigger apartment complexes, in order to draw in tenants and residents, they've got a certain amenity package. So essentially what that is, is just um, facilities that the residents are able to use. And this property at the moment for the grading has got a fairly competitive uh, amenity package and amenity set. Robert, were we going to do any improvements on that or was it mainly the interiors? Yes, we are. Um... Probably the main thing here on this particular one is we've got a couple of playgrounds, but there's no dog park, and that's a pretty common amenity with the type of resident that we typically go after. So that's one thing that we're going to add. Doesn't cost a lot of money, but it really does. Uh, it, you know, the main thing is you've got a lot of people there that already have pets, um, and we're actually going to be uh, kind of clamping down on that more in terms of making sure we get the rent for those pets that are there. But providing that dog park is a big amenity for people in that in that. Uh, you know, millennial type resident. So um, I was going to say, since we don't have a whole lot of time, probably the, the biggest thing I think 
to take away from this particular project is that we're currently, if you want to jump to the business plan, Ricky, because that's kind of the the, the short of it. Um, yeah. There's really three things that are going on here. So number one is we're below market rent if we do no renovations. So we've got some room to move the rents up regardless, simply because of uh, just where they're at in the market. They don't do any marketing. Um, it's currently a, a marketing by people driving by the complex, so very passive marketing. So we've got some room there. Secondly, as I mentioned, it's self-managed, so we're bringing in a professional management company. We worked with a company called Elmington. They're based out of Nashville. They also handle a couple other properties for us currently. They've done a great job, so we're going to bring them in, and that's going to really raise the level of the experience of the residents in the complex. And then last, we're going to do these renovations, which is going to take it from more of a C-class to a B-class. And again, that's really meeting the demand in that market for the type of housing that folks want. Um, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't have that demand, but now that you've got this re revitalization happening, you've got a lot of people that say, hey, we want a nicer place to live. And some of the people, they do want an A-class A uh, property, but the majority are looking for somewhere in the middle where, you know, they're not spending $1,200, $1,500 a month, um, but they want a nice place to live. They don't want to live in a, a sketchy, you know, type neighborhood. They want something nice. So that's really the the nuts and bolts of it. And then at the end of the day, of course, what does that generate us in terms of a return, um, which I know you guys talked about briefly before that. But that's really the bottom line is being able to provide value uh, in a market that's moving our way and capture good returns for our investors. The other thing I would say, and I don't know if we have an ability to send a link later on, but we have a nice promo video that we've done which I think visually shows uh, in a, I think it's two and a half minutes or something, but it visually kind of shows where this property is in relation to the re revitalization. And it, it, I think it gives a great picture for people to really understand the business plan here because every property is a little bit different, um, but this one has that specific sort of uh, process in place as the, as the revitalization has moved out towards the property. So anyway. That's great. So well, Robert and Richard, yeah, correct. Quick question from my side. I see in the slide in front of us, you have a strategy yeah. timeline. <laughs> One of the bits that caught my attention that's not usual for a lot of the deals on the Wealth Fund Grab platform is a plan to possibly do a supplemental loan and return capital halfway through the deal or uh, within that early section of the deal. Can you tell us more about that? I think some of our investors might find that an interesting play. Sure, yeah. So the the big uh, sort of key for us is, uh, which Ricky, Ricky talked about, the big key for us is not risking our capital. So what we want to do is go into a deal and execute on the value add plan, and then we're going to pull as much of that capital back out. So a supplemental loan, of course, is where we're going back to the bank. We're saying, hey, we've increased the value of the property. We'd like to take some of that money back. And our goal would be to get about 50% or more of that capital back in that supplemental loan period. So again, at this particular stage, we think we can get about 63% on this project when we do that supplemental loan. So it's a little bit better than the average. Um, but the goal would be between that supplemental loan and the distributions, by the time you hit that three to five year period, all of that initial capital is back. So all your risk is off the table. You still own the property. You're still getting distributions every quarter, but you've taken your risk off. And then of course, the benefit of that is that you, you've got two things. You've got the upside of the existing property, and then you're able to reinvest that money and essentially do it again with the same capital and not have the risk in the first one. So that's sort of the, the two sides of that model that really work well. Now, the other piece of it is that we don't want to over leverage the property when we do that, because of course if you do, then you're back to risking your potential upside. So we always want to make sure that our leverage is low enough that we're not going to be ever risking the capital that we have in it. And that's really kind of like our number one goal. So hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's a very interesting addition. Perfect. So, so Ricky, my suggestion here is let's see if, yeah, we don't have much time. We already quite a bit over. So maybe if you guys want to start wrapping up, we could do a final check. Lee, are there any final questions that have come through that we need to be paying attention to? If they're general wealth migrated platform questions, we can respond to those investors directly. Uh, but if you have any specific ones, while well, we have Robert and Ricky online. Uh, no, there's no um, direct questions for Robert and Ricky at the moment. Great. Perfect. So Ricky, I think final thoughts. Why final should thoughts we be doing this? Why should an investor be doing this one? 
Sure. So just one one minute before we get to final thoughts, of just mentioning our raise so far. We've uh, we've obviously launched here in the states with our own investor base, and uh, the total equity raise I think is seven point two million dollars, and we've got soft commitments of about five and a quarter million, five and a half, six million dollars already um, from a soft commitment basis here out of the states. So I think the project is speaking for itself to a large extent. And um, this particular deal has got a lot of healthy cash flow coming through. So for any investors that are looking for a steady cash flowing deal, I really believe this is the one. Brilliant. Robert, any final thoughts on your side? Thank you for joining us. It's great. Uh, we've known Ricky for a while, but it's always great to see a new face and a new sponsor on board with the Wealth My Guest platform. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you guys uh, giving us a chance. And even though we're halfway around the world, it's always fun to connect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I was just going to say any resources that we can provide information on the deal, uh, background on us, of course, we're happy to do that to get everybody comfortable on who we are and what we've done. I'm sure Ricky probably mentioned, you know, I've been at it for 20 years now. So um, and nothing against folks that have come into the business over the last five years, but we do feel that there's uh, you know, some value in being in the business for multiple market cycles and having been through ups and downs and understanding how those things uh, tend to go. And, you know, we build a lot of fudge factor into our deals because of that, because we really want to make sure that we can withstand whatever may come. Um, but at the same time, who knows? You know, right now in the States, as many of you guys know, things just continue to roll along and it could be another four years of, of a bull market in real estate. So, we really don't know, but we want to make sure we're prepared for that. And I've had a lot of questions about people asking about, you know, the working capital and the stress testing that we do. And we do leave money on the table purposely because of that. But I think it's important and I think it's the right strategy given where we're at in the market cycle. So um, anyway, that's just kind of a side note there, but that's, that's more of our thinking on how we look at deals and how we underwrite them. And um, we're a little bit more on the conservative side, but you know, I feel like if we can get a good return and still be conservative, why not? It's worth it. So, yeah, absolutely. Ricky and, Ricky and Robert, really appreciate you guys being. I think if we, um, you know, I think uh, this morning we all, uh, it was a bit late on our start. So, what we might do is see if we can't get you back in a week or two's time. Um, you know, a whole new investor base. Let's see if we can do this again. Um, sure. We often have a, a second follow-up session just so that as investors have had a turn to have a look at the deal and get more questions we can create an environment for you and them to have a chat through another webinar so I'll reach out Lee will reach out and, and help set that up um, from our side quickly I want to say to Sheila Sheila uh, in connection with your request for a review or summary review of the existing investments uh, either Ricky I mean either uh, not Ricky either Fritz or Alex from the Wealth Migrate team will reach out to you and they can talk you through those existing ones uh, to Jenny, in terms of uh, overseas allowances as well, I will get Fritz or Alex to reach out to yourself. Uh, for Rook, your question around what happens if you want to exit before the deal's finished, we will respond directly to you on that one. Um, that's really it in terms of the questions that we haven't yet dealt with. Uh, Fiona, as well, in terms of being from Zambia, and is that possible? Absolutely, and I will get Alex or Fritz to reach out to you as well. Um, so really what I want to do is I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, there are many places you could have been, except you chose to be with us today, and we really appreciate that. Uh, Ricky and Robert, we are looking forward to a long relationship with REM Capital. Uh, hopefully many deals um, over the years that can we can bring to our investors and help them grow a great divert, diversified global portfolio. So really looking forward to it. Lee and Scott, any last words from you guys? Thanks, guys, for being on. I yeah, know that it's. Side, uh, <laughs> I know it's very okay. early where you are, so we do appreciate uh, you coming on. Um, it looks like an exciting um, opportunity, so we look forward to having it live on our platform and also having you back on in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Scott, over to you. And Robert, I haven't uh, met you formally, but. But to Ricky, I, uh, I just shared before you arrived uh, what Ricky looked like eight years ago on his first American buyers trip. So uh, Robert, you can, uh, you can see what this was, the, this was his first trip to America when he was 21, 22. And, uh, and uh, looking at ironically multifamily in Orlando, opening bank accounts, 
and having some fun on the Memphis street. So I just That's thought it'd be great. a nice way to end off, Ricky. Uh, you know, we've worked together for the last eight years and I'm super excited to be working with you again. And um, I've always trusted you. You've always given our clients a very good experience. And on the basis of that, I'm really excited to meet you, Robert, because I know that Ricky's incredibly thorough. So look forward to a long and uh, fruitful partnership for our investors. So exciting. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks. Appreciate it, Thanks, Scott. Scott. Yeah, one, one day we'll make it over there to uh you know the other side of the uh, the other side of the globe <laughs> we, 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 we come that way as well. we'll uh we'll either we'll see each other on one one or other side of the ocean perfect and, awesome and that's really how i want to end with two last thoughts for me the first one is scott's already mentioned it so to all our investors this year is the year of the return of the bias trip so ah. I can see Ricky already gets excited. Uh, our buyer strips are a huge amount of fun. We take um, our investors, those who would like to join us, to either the UK or the US, depending on which trip you want to be a part of. You can go and meet people like Ricky and Robert in their offices, get to have a look at on the ground, see how it works, uh, meet all our different sponsors in those countries, and actually begin to deepen your own knowledge by meeting with people and talking to people like Ricky and Robert. And if you're going with Scott, I can guarantee you there'll be a huge amount of fun to be had as well, uh, wherever Scott is. This, fun this, was, this was due, this was due, due, due diligence on the nightlife, which is very equally important. <laughs> it's the so economic look out for those activity. Bias trips. activity. Look out for those bias trips this year. If you are interested either in the UK or the USA, uh, they are coming and uh, please contact Lee directly and she can start feeding you through the details. We haven't finalized dates. And then my final comment is on this particular uh, Linda, deal. We, so Linda, yeah. Linda, quickly, um, we haven't finalized the exact dates because we need to obviously work with the partners, but the intention is to do it in the second half of July for America and November for the UK. So just if people want to start making broad stroke plans. Brilliant. Thanks, Scott. And if there's a lot of demand, we might have to add a second or a third one to those dates. So just please do reach out to Lee and let her know if you'd like to join us. Uh, my final comment is this deal should be live um, by hopefully Friday or Monday. We're working with Ricky to get the documentation and uh, Robert, all the resources you mentioned, uh, Ricky will be passing those on to us so we can upload them to the platform and we can get the deal up and loaded and support investors into this great opportunity as soon as we can. So that's really it for today from our side. Thank you, I appreciate your patience. We have gone over time and look forward to seeing you all again uh, in the next webinars. Thanks guys, Thanks, have a great day for everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.